Good morning. You guys are the inaugural class of the Earth Engine User Summit. Um, this is the first time we've done it. We've done smaller workshops at conferences around the world like AGU and EGU. Um, and we debated whether we were ready to do something this big uh, here at the Googleplex because we not only know where Earth Engine is today, but we also see what's coming. And we're like, should we wait? Is it the right moment? But there's been so much interest and so much demand that we felt this was the right moment. So I wanted to welcome you and thank you for many of you have traveled halfway around the world to get here. I know we have people not only from all over the US, but uh, Brazil. We have a big group from Brazil. Um, Australia, Europe, um, I think Mexico. What am I missing? Canada, um, what am I missing? Costa Rica, China, Costa Rica, China. China. OK, so um, I think we have most of the continents covered except maybe Antarctic. Maybe that'll be next year. So thank you for traveling all this way. Um, we've put a lot of effort in putting this together for you. Some of you are almost experts in Earth Engine at this point, and some of you have, I think, never even touched it. So we've designed the, the three days to be able to accommodate all of you, whatever level you are, that you can get a lot out of this. Uh, many of you are leaders in this field you know, of geosciences and satellite remote sensing. You're working on things like natural resource management of forest and water, climate change, food security, public health. Um, so for us, it's a really great honor to have you all here. Because uh, we're very good at the, the tech side, uh, but you make it matter. You are the ones who apply the science, uh, you know, that we're, we're trying to turbocharge your science uh, for the betterment of uh, humanity and, and for our planet. So um, I have a, just a few slides, because I can't resist showing you some of the things that I like about Earth Engine before we really kick off uh, the whole conference. All right, so actually before we go into Earth Engine, today is a special day. It's uh, the 10th anniversary of Google Earth. Wow. Yeah, Woo! yay! Yeah, so Google Earth was technically launched, if you look in Wikipedia, uh, which is actually accurate in this case, it was launched on June 28th, 2005. And you know, our whole team is passionate about Google Earth. The Google Earth outreach team actually um, exists to foster the use of tools like Google Earth and Google Maps by nonprofits, indigenous people around the world to make the world a better place. It's been you know, the most realistic and detailed virtual globe ever put freely in the hands of the public. Um, we've got something like uh, 20 petabytes of satellite and aerial and ground-based imagery in there. Um, and it's just been, a, it's turned out to be a great canvas, a great virtual globe for storytelling with the power of KML. Um, many scientists are actually, have been using Google Earth as a visualization tool for scientific visualization of their results. Um, Google Earth used to be in a different team at Google, um, but we have uh, taken it over. So because we could see the potential for um, creating, kind of rebooting Google Earth, um, reinventing Google Earth, refreshing Google Earth, and someday actually even connecting Earth Engine and Google Earth. Uh, so we don't have anything specific to announce there, but that's kind of a future vision that we have of making a, a nice integration between Earth Engine and Google Earth. So today you'll see though what we're launching is, uh, it's called the Voyager layer. Uh, there's a Google blog post that literally was supposed to come out around now. And uh, what, is it out? All right, I checked. 10 of, and it wasn't, but good. So um, that talks about the 10th anniversary. And what's specifically launched today is not a new software version of Google Earth, but a new content layer that we call the Voyager layer. Um, and that is to help guide you to some of the most beautiful imagery that we have in Google Earth. 
So whether it's street view, special street view collects of Gombe National Park, where Jane Goodall does her research on, on, on chimpanzees, or you know, Galapagos, or the Taj Mahal, uh, or I think we have something like 1,500 uh, locations that are just exquisitely beautiful satellite imagery. Um, and also, people have always wondered, where is the fresh imagery? Right? Where did you just collect and publish new imagery? And we never made it easy for you to figure that out. Um, and finally, we have incredible 3D reconstructed cities in Google Earth. Well, where are those? So this is a, a look at the Voyager layer. When you open Google Earth today, you'll see a, um, a balloon that sort of guides you to that layer and, and experiencing that. Please don't open it now. <laughs> Lunchtime or break. But um, we're very excited about that. And it's kind of, we, we call it internally the uh, spark plug, you know, the sort of start of the reinvigorating of, of, of Google Earth for its next 10 years. All right. So speaking of Google Earth, Google Earth and Google Maps, do they do everything that we need? Well, no. For example, uh, you know, the surface of the Earth is changing in ways observable from space. You all are experts in this. This is deforestation in Rondonia uh, over, uh, I think, about a, a two-decade period. And while this is helpful in Google Earth that you can see with the historical imagery time slider, if you know how to operate it and so on, you can find some of this imagery. You can't do science on it. You can't measure it. You can't report on the statistical degree of change that has happened. And um, Carlos Souza, where's Carlos? <laughs> I'm going to pick on him. <laughs> uh, Dr. Carlos Souza of Amazon in Brazil, he actually suggested to us uh, that we should allow, we should build a new platform for doing science. Because his institution in Brazil um, has been an incredible watchdog in creating um, monitor, a monitor of the, uh, of the Amazon using MODIS data and now Landsat data to be able to detect change. And what he told us at that time, and this was back in 2008, that we were losing a million acres a year of the Amazon to deforestation, much of it happening in remote parts of the forest where there's not good law enforcement on the ground. So it's happening uh, without any intervention. But with daily satellite imagery, and as we all know, satellite imagery is getting better and better, uh, and with the science to do change detection, his institution had the ability to create a virtual monitoring system. The problem was, as he said, it was a brutal amount of data, terabytes of data, or ultimately you know, petabytes of data. And when you try to run the analysis, the change detection on a single computer over all that data, it could take weeks. Uh, and so he basically said, Rebecca, Google apparently has a lot of computers. You have a lot of the imagery data already, but you're just publishing it for visualization in Google Earth and Google Maps. Would you let us do science on it? Create a platform where we can actually map and measure and monitor change um, and, and extract features. So that was very intriguing. Um, it was just before the Copenhagen Climate Change Conference there was a lot of debate about uh, a new uh, policy called RED that many of you may know about, or RED Plus, for creating financial incentives to reduce tropical deforestation, because deforestation accounts for somewhere between 12 and 20% of greenhouse gas emission. But there was no good map of global forest cover and change. There was a lot of skepticism about whether it was even possible to create a financial instrument around deforestation if it couldn't be measured. So that told us this was really a Google scale problem, a Google scale challenge, and we set off to build Earth Engine. So Earth Engine, unlike Google Earth and Google Maps, is designed to derive information from Earth observation data at scale. Um, and it's to map and, and monitor and, and measure a changing planet. You know, as we're sitting here, uh, I think you know, many of you know there's a plethora of hardworking satellites up there. Many of them are public, free, um, such as you know, NASA satellites. And now, good news, ESA, right, the Sentinel satellites, 
are producing vast amounts of public open free data. Um, the challenge in the past, well, actually, so one example, which many of you, you know, many of you are very familiar with Landsat. Um, at this point, there's more than 4 million Landsat images in the Landsat archive going back uh, more than 40 years. It's the longest running systematic Earth observing mission ever. Um, incredible data that was unfortunately coming off, well, fortunate in one perspective, anyway, coming off these satellites and going onto tapes in a vault in South Dakota. So this is at US Geological Survey Aeros Data Center. The data is very secure um, on these tapes, which is great. Uh, the government should make sure that we protect this data for posterity, but it wasn't very accessible. Um, people couldn't actually do analysis on that data sitting on tapes. So this was an example of one of the data sets that Carlos Souza and other scientists uh, suggested that we liberate out of these dusty government archives and bring online so that you could do you know, near real time processing at scale. So we, you know, we've chosen initially a set of satellites that we are uh, creating feeds of data from. It's all voted on by our community of users, what data sets you think are most important. You're going to hear more about all of this, so I'm just going to kind of breeze through. But anyway, we chose, we chose a set of satellites initially, and we worked, for example, with USGS Eros for more than three years to get that historic archive off tape. They've been fantastic to work with. Um, we're very grateful to them for that. And then now we're getting the data as it's collected every day from Landsat 7, Landsat 8, uh, and so on. And it's all now co-located, the storage of this data online on spinning disk is co-located with thousands of computers for processing the data in parallel. And that's really kind of the breakthrough, is having the big data co-located with the big processing. So when you have that kind of data now, what can you do with it? One of the challenges that we heard from the scientific community is many of the satellite images, and traditionally people would work at the scene level, at the image level, would have problems. There would be clouds, cloud shadows, gaps from the SLC failure of the Landsat 7. Many scientists don't even work with Landsat 7 data because 22% of the pixels are missing. Um, and so our uh, approach with Earth Engine is forget scenes, forget the image level. Let's just talk about pixels. We bring all the data online and let you essentially do statistics and fuse data from different scenes to be able to, for example, in this case, uh, remove clouds. So uh, this is, I think, Borneo. Um, but Landsat collects something like 22 images a year over every place on Earth. You can stack those images up and select statistically the least cloudy pixel and end up producing a mosaic or composite. Instead of like this, it's like this. Or the Isle of Mull in England kind of always looks like that, uh, but we can make it look like that, which it never actually does, but every pixel in there is correct and, uh, and has metadata associated with it, the date, uh, the scene from which it came. Um, this is showing you a little uh, animation of how this can work in Earth Engine, where we're bringing in these strips of Landsat data. And as each strip comes in, we are choosing the best pixel from the stack of images or uh, over that uh, area and end up, I think this is a one year composite, end up producing a reasonably cloud free image of all of California. So with that approach in Earth Engine, uh, we took, we started to apply this at continent scale and global scale. This is what South America used to look like in Google Earth and Google Maps. Um, now it looks like this. Uh, and then we ap applied it to the global set of Landsat data. This was back in 2013 and produced a 15 meter global cloud free image of the entire planet as if it was a sunny spring day everywhere. Again, the Earth never looks like that, but it's 
it's been amazing the feedback we've heard, even like from NGOs on the ground in Ecuador who are trying to do conservation planning and using Google Earth and Google Maps as a tool, and they couldn't before because of the clouds covering 60% of the country, and now they can. <clears throat> but more important for science, right, uh, I know that many of you spend a lot of time in pre-processing, downloading data, you know, whatever, geo-registering it, atmosphere correction, um, removing clouds, cloud shadows. Finally, just to get to the point where you can start to do your science, that's the kind of thing that is not cutting edge science. It's really data management. It's very well established how to do that sort of thing. And that's the kind of thing we take care of for you so that it's staged for you to do your analysis. <clears throat> But getting back to, we're still on the visualization part here. We thought, well, now that we know how to produce these cloud-free global images, we have you know, decades worth of Landsat data for the whole planet. Why not produce uh, a time lapse of Earth? Um, and we did that, um, published that in 2013. Um, and it's looking at three decades of Earth where we have an image, we've created that composite, relatively cloud-free image of uh, every, every Landsat pixel, every 30 meter location, um, and for, for every place on Earth and for every year from 1984 to 2012. And then working with the um, Carnegie Mellon uh, Create Lab team, um, turned that into an HTML5 video animation that you can experience on the web. So if you go to earthengine.google.org slash timelapse, you'll see this kind of thing. Um, and we have this everywhere. These are just some interesting locations. Las Vegas was the fastest growing city in the US during this period. What's interesting is while Las Vegas is growing, Lake Mead is shrinking. Interesting observations you can make. So time lapse, uh, we released that in co um, collaboration with Time Magazine, who did great reporting on what were the phenomena that you could really appreciate for the first time of change. Um, but the point I wanted to make was, what did it take to build that time lapse uh, animation over three decades? Well, it was we, we sifted through more than 2 million Landsat images to find the best pixel for each year in each spot and then stitching it all together. It was almost a petabyte of data. Um, it took 2 million hours of computation, but because we ran it on 66,000 computers in parallel, Google Data Centers, we had the result in a day and a half. On a single computer, what do you think it would take? <laughs> I'll tell you, 300 years. <laughs> um, so at first, you know, when we were first building Earth Engine, we were thinking, oh, it'll be good for putting the data in people's hands and they can use it to solve small problems you know, easily. And, but now what we've really realized is what's really the breakthrough is you can solve unimaginably huge problems now using this platform. Um, and again, you're going to learn much more about all of that. So last thing I wanted to go through are actually now some examples of how it's been applied. Um, and some of you in this room are, your work is, is I'm going to be showing here. So Carlos, like I said, I'm going to embarrass Carlos. This is the system for monitoring of deforestation that, uh, that he had developed. Uh, here it is now running in Google Earth Engine, operationally monitoring the Brazilian Amazon while we're sitting here uh, since June uh, 2012. Um, it looks like this. You get areas of, of red that are deforestation detected within the last 30 days. That it, you see there's a threshold. You can play with different parameters. Uh, and then these are validated by uh, knowledgeable people before the data is then published every month in a bulletin that goes right into law enforcement, the media, and so on. And this was, we've learned so much from Carlos about it's not about the pixels. It's about the knowledge, the information contained in those pixels and unlocking that information and then delivering that information in a form that is actionable by society, whether it's government or NGOs or you know, communities or media, like doing the magic to turn that into, into knowledge. 
So as Carlos said, it, it, it's really reduced the time for producing the information, and it has now made it more possible to share this technology with other countries. And I think he's going to be talking about that. Um, I don't know if Matt Hansen's here yet, but Matt has uh, Matt Hansen of University of Maryland. Um, it's been a great honor to work with him as well. Uh, some of you may know that he is you know, a leader in global land remote sensing. He had produced MODIS level products of, uh, of forest cover and change. Working with, with Earth Engine, he moved those models over onto our platform and was able to run them at the first time at Landsat resolution. Uh, and that produced the first detailed, you know, 30 meter resolution maps of forest cover and change from 2000, 2012 that was published in Science um, in November 2013. That's what it looks like. Uh, this is uh, global forest cover and, yes, forest loss, forest gain um, over that 12 year study period. It was updated again to cover 2013 and we expect to update it annually uh, because we just, now that it's the methodology is in Earth Engine and we have all the Landsat data coming in, uh, automatically it's a matter of turning the crank to run it uh, again annually. Uh, th this is another big data. Now this is now big science. Um, that was almost 700,000 Landsat scenes, a million hours of computation. We ran that on 10,000 computers in parallel. Um, so that took four days. That one would have taken 15 years on a single computer. So again, this is the kind of large-scale scientific result that we, we really are uh, passionate about. Now, the other thing we're passionate about with our geo for good kind of focus um, is not just producing scientific papers, but getting that information out in a way that creates change, positive change in the world. So we've also partnered with WRI on Global Forest Watch. Um, if you check out globalforestwatch.org, it, it is a platform that is, first of all, hosting this data uh, produced with uh, Matt Hansen, also some other algorithms, Carlos Souza's Saj algorithm, um, to create kind of a one-stop shop for both annual forest cover and change and near real-time forest cover and change, bringing together all of the best algorithms in the world. It's powered by Earth Engine. You can come in and interact with it. Um, and for example, draw a polygon and get statistics uh, that, you know, this is a query that goes back to Earth Engine and comes back with a result. It's a very, very beautifully developed web application. Uh, I like this comment. This came out in IEEE Spectrum. Earth Engine brings big data to environmental activism. Um, when a tree falls in the forest these days, it doesn't just make a sound, it causes an alert to be sent to activists and so on. And more importantly, as I mentioned, getting the data into the hands of those institutions that are responsible for making these decisions about managing natural resources. The government of Indonesia, for example, is now themselves using this tool um, for, for their law enforcement. All right, so I'm going to end with a whirlwind of a few other applications. Um, <coughs> David Lalamont of Stanford has used Earth Engine to model. This is the San Andreas Fault. Don't be too concerned. We're not that close to it here. But we're slightly red, not super <laughs> red. Um, but yeah, modeling predicted ground acceleration from if the next big one were to hit. Uh, in Australia, the Australian government has brought in, you can bring in your own raster data sets. So they brought in their own uh, LIDAR data, one, one um, meter resolution, very accurate uh, uh, DEM, and DSM. And they first modeled building footprints and then produced this, we're zoomed out a little bit, this kind of dashboard of based on predicted sea level rise, you see these gauges, they, they dynamically change the areas that would be inundated because they have that digital elevation information. And then they model what is the impact to buildings, uh, people's lives, and, and, and value, financial value. Rick Allen is here and Aisha Killick is here. They're doing great work um, on evapotranspiration, agricultural 
water consumption, which is critical for us in the West. Um, right? You can see this kind of, I, I believe they're going to talk about this, so I won't say much more. But yeah, this is uh, water consumption by vegetation. Drought monitoring, also critical with climate change. Justin Huntington and uh, folks at Desert Research Institute are doing near real time uh, mapping of, of drought. Um, actually anomalously wet or anomalously dry conditions and working toward a prediction uh, engine. Um, they're calling it climate engine. So this, this will be essentially like global forest watches for deforestation. This will be a climate related web application powered by Earth Engine. Um, we're really excited to have uh, Alan Bellward speaking tomorrow from Joint Research Center of the European Commission. They're doing global surface water mapping uh, over time, going over a three decade period of leveraging the Landsat data in Earth Engine, looking at both interannual and intraannual water, global surface water. Um, these are different places around the world. Again, you will hear all about this. You know, we keep being surprised. We keep assuming that, oh, there must be a good map for something. And we keep learning from many scientists that actually there is not a detailed, high resolution, fresh map of XYZ, fill in the blank. So human settlements, the, the human footprint or where people live over time on the planet has not been well mapped at 30 meter resolution. Dr. Paolo Gamba uh, is doing this now. This is an area in China that had never been mapped at this scale. Previous maps showed the larger population centers, but the smaller villages could only be detected using Landsat. Uh, the last example, um, moving into public health, uh, UC San Francisco is building a prediction engine uh, and a spatial decision support system for predicting malaria. Um, and the first area is going to be in Swaziland because, and again, you will hear from Hugh about this. Um, we're very excited about it. Leveraging all of the uh, environmental data, you know, rainfall, temperature, the greening of the landscape you can see in satellite imagery, you can predict where outbreaks of mosquitoes will be hatching in the future. You can then uh, intersect that with areas of population and come up with a, a targeted risk map uh, and a focus on where to do medical intervention. Again, he's going to be speaking about that. So long story short, um, for us, it's all about you guys. It's, uh, we build a few products ourselves, like time lapse and like that cloud-free composite of the planet. But that's sort of a side thing. The real reason we build Earth Engine is for, for you all. Um, and to help turbocharge your work, accelerate your work, simplify your work, make it easier for you to collaborate with one another um, so that we can you know, live more sustainably on the planet, for example. Uh, we've got more than 4,000 institutions now on Earth Engine. And um, again, I'm very pleased that, that you're all here. Please like, eat a good breakfast every morning. Get a good rest every night. We are going to spin your head around several times with all the information that we are going to give you. Um, and you know, again, thank you so much for coming.